Drop a line and catch some fresh fish. It's more of Go Fish with Mike Buck. And the segment of the program is brought to you by our friends at the Western Pacific Regional Fishery Management Council. As you know, uh, by the way, we've got a fisheries forum coming up real, real soon. And you, of course, are invited. We hope you are able to participate. And participating today, as you know, the council reaches out and, and does a lot of things with a lot of people. Uh, and we've learned more and more what sort of their mission is. And, and what most of what they do is, is plan to evaluate how the fishery is doing. And, and to, that, uh, to that point... Uh, we have joining us today Jeff Polovina. He's a chief ecosystem uh, at the Pacific Islands Science Fisheries Science Center, which is a big, big mouthful. But you're going to learn today that we're doing uh, things there that are providing us with a, a lot of guidance. And what we're talking about is, is the ecosystem and the fisheries. And I know that's pretty, a pretty broad stroke of the brush. But, Jeff, before we get into what you do, let's find out a little bit about you. Where, where was your initial interest in this? Where did you, where did you start cultivating this, this scientific interest? Well, I've always been interested in the ocean mm-hmm. and um, being able to look at um, how f- fish and, and uh, the whole ecosystem works is it's been a real uh, intrigue. Where did you grow up? Where's home? Well, I grew up on the East Coast mm-hmm. and kept moving westward. Mm-hmm. I uh, did my graduate work at Berkeley and uh, came out uh, and sailed around the Pacific, uh, all across the Pacific, and happened to stop in Hawaii in the mid '70s. And the rest and is history. The rest is history. I said, "Hey, this is a really nice place." Yeah. Uh, you know, interestingly enough, uh, now that we're looking backwards, uh, both in, in in Hawaii and other parts of the world, a lot of these. Older civilizations or, or previous uh, uh, generations, uh, they were pretty responsible. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, they, they had some pretty good, uh, some pretty good science and, and some pretty good uh, ideas. Are you fascinated by that as I am? Well, certainly the Hawaiians had the apua'a mm-hmm. concept where they mm-hmm. linked land and the ocean, uh, and they took a, you know, an, an ecosystem perspective. What are your uh, what are your aspirations now as to the work that you're doing? Um, first of all, let us know a little bit more about the uh, uh, the the science center. What what is the what is the structure there? What's it about? Well, there's a number of divisions of mm-hmm. research divisions there. There's a coral reef division. There's a fisheries division. Uh, I run the ecosystems and oceanography division, which takes a broad look at all parts of the ecosystem mm-hmm. from the physical uh, basis all the way up to the apex species. Mm-hmm. We do things like putting tags on tunas and sharks and turtles and looking at how they're using the ocean. We use satellite data to understand ocean features, fronts and eddies, and how those lot create habitat. Yeah. Uh, but what I was interested to find out is, when you said the apex, mm-hmm. that, a, that a lot of the studies before were done on those. Exactly. And from what I understand now, you're looking at a broader spectrum of species. Uh, to what avail? I mean, why yeah. is that going to be well, valuable? That's absolutely right, Mike. Uh, traditionally, folk, people have focused on the management by looking at what's being taken, the target species and the fishing effort for food. Mm -hmm. But the ecosystem will change for many reasons, Uh, changing habitat, changing productivity at the base of the food web, changes in the middle of the food web, the prey that the animals eat can change due to ocean Mm -hmm. conditions. So what we're trying to do is provide a broad look at how the ecosystem is changing um, to provide guidance to managers that give them a bigger picture of how the ecosystems responding yeah, and, I, and i'm wondering if sometimes and i and i know the way it boils down here in hawaii is pretty simple we'll talk about that in a little bit but what i think is fascinating is the attention being paid now i have for instance the skippers and some of the guys from that uh mm-hmm. wicked tuna uh, uh you know b- b- reality show on mm-hmm. and you know how tightly monitored for bluefin mm-hmm. the eastern seaboard is right. and then what about people like yourself that that, that saw the the decimation of sharks i mean you mm-hmm. know look at for up until very recently, I mean, shark fin soup was like on every street corner in yeah. some parts of the world. Yeah. yeah. No, and that's sharks are a big part of the ecosystem, mm-hmm. and so and they're very vulnerable. So, you know, monitoring yeah. shark catch rates in the fishery is is an indicator of vulnerable species, and you want to maintain a, a certain. We we level know of those. we know sometimes, Jeff, that the economics of scale dictate what you can and can't do Mm -hmm. how many staff members you have doing this and that and i would imagine in the very beginning uh in the in the research that you and others have been doing was based on okay here's how much we have and here's what we can look Mm -hmm. at are we becoming more alarmed uh 
to, to look at the bigger picture now that we better look at, like, okay, we're talking about tuna, but we didn't pay any attention to what they eat. Now mm-hmm. we're finding out that we're taking what they eat, mm-hmm. so they can't grow anymore. Right. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it, it's a darn if you do, darn if you don't. Right. So, I mean, we, we, the good side, the good thing, the budgets haven't been increasing, but the good thing is the tools have been getting better. I mean, when yeah, I started, we, we had so limited ability to look at anything other than the, the catch of the target yeah. species, and now we have all sorts of tools from satellites to tags to various ways of sampling trawls and, and looking at uh, yeah, genetics. Yeah, I'm fascinating and, um, by, I'm fascinated by, the other day we had uh, a couple of guys in, we're talking about doing uh, a food surveys with GoPro cameras and grids. Right, and yeah. And you guys are all involved in some of this neat technology now. Yeah, and then there's some basic technology. One of the things that we're doing for the pelagic fishery is we have this sampling program of the diets of lancet fish. Mm-hmm. And lancet fish are provided to us by the observers on the longline fishery, and they have this ability to maintain the prey in them uh, very well preserved. Amazing. So we can go back 25 years because there's earlier Japanese work, Mm. and we can see how the prey um, of a lot of these pelagic animals has or has not changed over time. Well, you'll you'll know that in the community here in Hawaii, Mm that the biggest secret is what lure and what color did you use? Sure. You know, because there's some magic, you know. When you learn that fish are a little bit more colorblind than we thought and some other things, but it's the fishermen who the the lure has to appeal to. But every now and again when you're out trolling, you talk about a pelagic, you catch a mai mai and throw Mm -hmm. them on the deck, and out comes some ika. You think, well, that's pink. Let's use a pink lure. There's science to that. Sure, yeah. Yeah. And and the combination of prey is really, I think, important to – how the energy moves up the food web. Uh, if there's more jellyfish and fewer ika, then uh, there's less energy going to the top of the food web. What, and what would suggest to support this? Because I, I want to liken it to like somebody that's at a buffet line, mm-hmm. you know, with a plate, and you're hungry, you're picking the stuff that you really want to eat. Mm-hmm. Uh, do fish have that choice, do you think, or do they, are they likely to just say, hey, I don't care what it is, I've got to eat? Yeah, well, we see that the diets of, of fish seem to be persistent for quite a long time, mm-hmm. so they're pretty... Part of it is what's there. May be a little part of it is what they can, available. Part of it is what they catch. Part of it is I think that uh, the caloric value of the organisms mm-hmm. they're eating, and they may, they, but I think. If they're presented with a variety of prey of the size they can eat, they're probably going to take it. I know little kids are fascinated when you talk about things like whales yeah. and what do they eat. They think that they eat aku or, or marlin yeah. or yeah. something yeah. because they're big. Yeah. But isn't it also fascinating that some of the things you eat uh, I mean, you, you, you study, eat things that are about the same size as they are. I mean, look at voraciously like an ono, what he'll try to eat. Sure, yeah. right. So, I mean, typically uh, a lot of fish tend to eat something about the weighs about one one hundredth of their mass. Yeah, yeah. But, but then you do find these exceptions like these, you know, three foot, four foot lancet fish will have mm-hmm. a juvenile lancet fish that's two feet long in their stomach yeah. or, a, or a big, you know, plastic bag or something. For I mean, those that don't know what you're talking about when yeah. you talk about lancet, what are they? Well, there's... A uh, long, skinny fish mm-hmm. that's caught in the longline fishery. Mm-hmm. And in fact, it's the most abundant catch in the longline fishery, but it uh, has no commercial value, mm-hmm. so it's typically discarded. So it's bycatch and it's, it's, it's discarded. Bycatch and it's discarded. Uh, have, they, have they, anybody looked into uh, making it have value? Why do they have no value? Just their, their Yeah, the flesh is fairly watery and mm-hmm. they just sort of fall yeah. off the line uh, yeah. mostly, uh, but they're great predators out there and they give us a great way to measure the the diet so of, when you say you that you do that mm-hmm. typically uh on a long line boat that somebody's going to retain mm-hmm. this lancelet fish for how big are they oh uh, they can be uh two meters uh mm-hmm. up to six, six feet, feet. Yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah so they got a lot of stuff in their gullet they do yeah. they have an incredible yeah. diet of stuff and we're seeing uh you know some really interesting stuff that uh some uh, Pelagic octopuses and squids that uh, we haven't seen over 20, or that are sort of new to the to the time series. Uh, as valuable as that, you say that yeah. you're looking at doing you know doing more. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess does that give you like a snapshot in time of? I mean, if you find out from say the longline vessel mm-hmm. where they were about mm-hmm. when they yeah. caught that, spe- mm-hmm. is, is it is is the science that that exact? I mean, can you find out? Well, we can certainly see how the composition of prey items might mm-hmm. change in 
across yeah. the Pacific and in time, seasonally. When we talk about uh, the, the, the expansion of species, mm-hmm. let's get, make people understand. When Most of us, when we talk about people listening to the Go Fish Show, for instance, we're looking about the, the four flagfish and we're looking at you know, the, 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 the pelagics. But a lot of our divers and a lot of our, our whippers and dunkers, they look at the whole big picture. Mm-hmm. Um, it's often been said, and maybe you can elaborate on that, that a fish doesn't know what grit he's in, whether he's mm-hmm. inshore, medium, or mm-hmm. out in the deep sea. How do you differentiate your, the studies that you do as to what part of the planet they apply to. Mm. Well, I mean, we look at different ecosystems. Mm-hmm. We, we the coral reef ecosystem, the deep, you know. So that's mm-hmm. the thing the divers would experience in the shore right. fishermen. Uh, and then we look at the deep slope ecosystem, which is more the bottom fish habitat, and then the yeah. offshore pelagic or the three broad. Okay, let's talk for a minute about some of the alarm that's recently gone up. I mean, as we become more, I guess. Uh, in, in tune with buying into or not buying into global warming. Mm-hmm. Certainly some of the things that happen in the ecosystem inshore, like in reefs and whatnot, mm-hmm. uh, the, the resilience of the ocean to me is fascinating. Mm-hmm. And for a scientist, it must be even more so. How can a place that was so bad return? Yeah, yeah, so that's that's, all, that's a positive sign mm-hmm. that, that the ecosystem is resilient, and it's, um, but there's also these tipping points where mm-hmm. if you push it too far, sometimes it can turn to another state. A coral reef can become more overgrown with algae mm-hmm. if the herbivore population goes down and nutrient input or uh, sediment input comes in. And so the challenge is, is to not to push it to Jeff, a tipping do we, point. Do we, do we sometimes, Jeff, get past that and, and almost in retrospect and then be in denial about what we have to do to write it? Well, you know, that's what I'm worried about. Sometimes we don't, yeah, yeah, we certainly, the the challenge that we have is to identify the tipping point before Mm -hmm. we've crossed it, if there is such a a, a thing. But some ecosystems uh, seem to be uh, fairly resilient in in rebounding uh, when you cut back the the various pressures on it. When I looked through the materials that uh, I reviewed prior to our conversation, I I, I saw something called Ocean Health Index. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think maybe if you can explain that, more of us would be likely to either turn something loose or not or or take the lines out of the water if the species were too small. Uh, I know that that when people have demands to eat mm-hmm. or to produce an income that these are blurred lines, but yeah. they they seem to be sort of important. So maybe you can under let us know what that ocean health index is. Right. So that's another approach to monitoring. One approach is to monitoring different parts of the ecosystem. Uh, this ho- ocean health index monitors the services that the ecosystem provides. Mm-hmm. So it's a, an approach that's been used around the globe, and we're starting to apply it here in Hawaii, where you look at the 10 different types of services that the ecosystem provides, uh, fisheries, tourism, recreation, uh, coastal protection, uh, biodiversity, clean water. There's a whole suite of these. Sure. And by measuring, so it, it, it's it's looking at evaluating an ecosystem based on the services it's providing that's really key i I don't want i I need to interrupt only to throw this one question in there here's an example of that gang you'll notice recently we've had this decision to either limit or curtail certain things about aquarium uh fish on the big island on the corner coast and a lot of that was driven by there's a huge snorkeling Mm -hmm. tourist industry and they want to see these little fish they don't want to see where fish used to be Mm -hmm. so that must be the difficult part in sort of adjudicating who gets what exactly so you have to evaluate all the the ways Mm -hmm. the ecosystem is providing services and Mm -hmm. balance those Mm -hmm. conflicts yeah because i i would imagine that if depending on who you talk to if you talk to the akuli guy all Mm -hmm. he cares about is a yeah Nobody should be in the water here so these are cool. He can grow so we can come mm-hmm. and catch them. And there's another guy says, well, I just want to take pictures. And the other guy says, well, I want to hook them. The other yeah. guy says, I want to spear mm-hmm. them. Yeah. So that is... I'm guessing, that, and that's one of the reasons why the Western Pacific Regional Fishery Management Council has all these meetings, to try to parse this out. Right, to balance mm-hmm. these different mm-hmm. uh, you know, user interests and uh, make sure that you know, one doesn't sort of dominate or push an ecosystem into an undesirable state. Do we have, at some points, when we have decisions, say, being made uh, by fisheries in Washington that mm-hmm. affect you know, the Pacific, that, that where they get their information is pretty key. And the more they get, mm-hmm. the more valid information they get, the better. I want to talk about maybe the models that you that mm-hmm. get generated out of the work that you do. Okay. So we run ecosystem models mm-hmm. to try to move from just looking at a single species to the entire ecosystem. These models are still somewhat um, you know, 
exploratory or experimental, but uh, they allow us to evaluate you know, how different mm-hmm. parts of the ecosystem would change. If you, uh, you know, remove uh, fishing uh, or if you increase fishing, uh, how the lower trophic levels respond to that. Um, if the climate change is reducing the productivity at the base of the food web, how that will mm-hmm. percolate up. Uh, yeah, so it's a lot more than just take or no take. Oh, yeah. You know, because, yeah. you know, interestingly enough, at the last council meetings, mm-hmm. when we had our fishers forum, and don't forget, folks, there's another one coming right up. We'll tell you about that uh, next week. It's going to be at the, uh, at the, uh, at the uh, Harbor View Center um, on Tuesday night, this next Tuesday night, uh, a week from now. A week from when you're listening to this, and it's very, very important because that's going to, what we're going to be discussing there is ex- exactly what we're talking about, and that is the sharing of information. I, I'm this is kind of rambling, but at the last forum, we had a couple of young gals that were doing their thesis and doing some reports, and it was about about. Um, Stock assessments. Mm-hmm. And isn't that a big part? You know, a stock assessment is very valuable, but all of the things you're talking about in your studies are ancillary to the stock assessment. Right. Yeah. So that's additional information mm-hmm. that we provide to managers. So mm-hmm. they see sort of a single species issue, but we also try to give them a bigger picture of indicators and trends that are impacting the whole ecosystem yeah. from the composition of all of the catch uh, to the primary productivity uh, to the habitat. Uh, so it's a broader you know, I, look. I want to liken back to when I was a small kid, I used to spend an awful lot of time diving uh, uh, on the Kona Coast. Mm-hmm. And there were some places where we, where we used to dive a lot mm-hmm. that your memory, remember, you, you remember it as this pristine place with teeming with fish and wildlife and take what you want and leave everything else. And you go back there 40 or 50 years later and say, it doesn't look the same. Part of that's true. Mm-hmm. But actually part of it's quite alarming when you see where it used to be vibrant live coral reefs are mm-hmm. isn't it? Right. Yeah. I mean, Puaco, yeah. for example, the corals have declined about. dramatically yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but it seems like in that case, the residents are responding mm-hmm. and uh, it looks like the impact is sewage uh, from uh, septic tanks and uh, yeah. people, yeah. Are, are people are being more responsible. That. Yeah. I, I guess, and, and that's one of the reasons why in previous programs and going forward with this show, we try to talk about how important it is to be getting all of the stakeholders together to realize that because I had a guy on a couple of months ago from the mainland and he was talking about the Hudson River mm-hmm. where you couldn't see the bottom mm-hmm. and and we did everything we possibly could to that mm-hmm. to New York Harbor and it is rebounded because mm-hmm. of stewardship yeah there's some yeah. great stories yeah. of how yeah. really damaged ecosystems mm-hmm. have recovered uh, when people get together and, and make a conscientious effort when given given the best case scenario uh, outside of this ocean uh, health index that we mm-hmm. talked about let's talk about the the the, the way you select the species. For instance, mm-hmm. you said before we'd look at the apex and, and look at, at, say, the eye. Mm-hmm. And now we're going to look at, say, 10 species. Right. Um, where's the input from that come from? Well, from the longline fishery, it comes from the observers and the logbook yeah. data. And that's a terrific uh, data source. Please uh, explain, for those that don't know, how that operates. Because we've talked to a lot of longline skippers yeah. and a lot of people. Some people don't like the idea, but a lot of these young people that we've had on, it's an experience, and they know they're doing some good. How mm-hmm. valuable is that information? Uh, the observer data is just critical. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's our only observing system uh, that tells us something about all the high-level species in the, mm-hmm. that are being caught yeah. by the fishery. So it's, it's, mm-hmm. it's our only indicator of what the top of the ecosystem is doing. And, uh, what are some of the things that maybe, as a researcher, uh, you found fascinating when this information first started coming in, when these people were novices that were out there really to make sure that there weren't too many loggerhead turtles or, or s- some other species involved, right? Yeah, exactly. So the, the observer program was focused on protected species yeah. interactions. Yeah. and But we have two decades of uh, information on fish catch of all sorts of species yeah. in the longline fishery mm-hmm. that tells us about, for example, the percent of apex or long uh, large species has declined by 50%. And as a result, though, the smaller species like pomfret and mahi and wahoo, uh, uh, ono, mm-hmm. have, have increased by mm-hmm. about 25% in the, in the catch rates. So there's a top-down response. You remove a mm-hmm. large number of these large animals, and you get an increase in the in the second level of animals because they're not getting eaten. exactly the second level is not getting eaten by exactly. the big guys that used There's to be a, there. A predation release, but, but it's sooner or later you run out of everything. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. that's yeah. the concern, and mm-hmm. the question is: is the management that's focused on a few species enough to 
keep the structure and the function of the ecosystem intact. And that's where that's I'm where guessing yeah. that the stock assessments become valuable. And the reason why I say that is because a lot of times people say, well, now they're looking at marlin. They're going to gonna maybe limit the number of marlin you get. And then when is when are they going to start looking at mai mai and ono and, and, and ulua and all of the other species? Because it does make sense that you can't say, look, if you take all the marlin away and the mai mai start, you can't take the mai mai out of the water fast enough to make them decrease. Right. You know? Mahi are pretty resilient, yeah, but, yeah. but we want to maintain a structure of the ecosystem that's you know, not, too, uh, dis- not too changed. So we want to look at the whole e- ecosystem um, and make sure that we don't reduce the marlins and the tunas yeah. by too large a number. You know, one of the things we find out from different people from the council that visit us, uh, especially from some of the, uh, the our neighbors f- f- throughout the rest of the Pacific, they come back with stories that where they had either almost devastated their entire economy mm-hmm. and that where they realized that, all right, we have to rethink this. I want to go back to the value of getting all of this stuff amalgamated. Uh, in other words, Hawaii is not the center of the universe. We're just mm-hmm. part of it. You know, sure. I mean, we, we have these preferences, right? But we have a fleet that goes out further and further catching these things. Right. So, I mean, we are dealing mm-hmm. with a, a stock and, a, and an ecosystem that that's ranges very widely from, uh, you know, our long line fishery goes from the Dateline to mm-hmm. close to the you know, coast of California and from the equator all the way up. You know, do, do you find it north. as fascinating as I do, Jeff, that, uh, that of all of the people have to pay attention to the rules that our, our longline fleet seems to be pretty well monitored more than anybody else's that I know of? They certainly are, yeah. especially uh, when you look at the foreign fleets that mm-hmm. have very little uh, management or regulation, yeah. uh, which is... Well, yeah. they, got some, they have some fishing boats that haven't been in the port for years. They don't need to go in. They, mm-hmm. they get their fuel, they get their crews, they get their food, they get everybody. Uh, okay, but in, in, in a perfect world... Uh, having, uh, you know, going forward with what you're doing uh, at, at where you are, at the Pacific Islands Fisheries uh, Center, what, what are the big challenges? I mean, what, are you, what keeps the boat floating, mm-hmm. say? Yeah, well, I mean, one, one issue is some of these indicators, you know, what are the critical thresholds? Mm-hmm. Like how if the percent of uh, large fish have been reduced by 50% since the start of the fishery, you know, is that a threshold? Are we are we getting close to some point where the ecosystem is is going to be damaged? Um, mm-hmm. We're seeing impacts of climate change. Uh, you know, how is that going to impact uh, the carrying capacity of the ecosystem? Do you find as scientists mm-hmm. that people are more willing to embrace that there is global warming? I do know that there's a huge divide in the scientific community whether this is something that happened to the planet anyway or is this something that we're doing obviously taking fish out of the water we're doing sure you know yeah and i think the evidence is you know so overwhelmingly positive that global warming is occurring Mm -hmm. there'll be winners there'll be losers but uh and it's uh you know human induced almost all of us are thinking about what's for dinner tonight and tomorrow rather than what's in five years. And in your community, you need to deal with what's going to be left if we keep going at this rate. Is that correct? That's correct, yeah. yes. Um, wh- are we getting anywhere? I mean, I know that greed and, and need uh, make people want to throw science away, but the sooner people find out that the science is valid, it, what you're doing is, is, mm-hmm. is real and not somebody just guessing. That's mm-hmm. important. You know? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, you know, I think managers are taking it more seriously, mm-hmm. uh, and they're regulating the fisheries, uh, yeah. you know, uh, in a positive way. I, I think that people need to understand. Once again, I want to go back to our longline fleet. That these guys are pretty highly monitored, mm-hmm. and what they can and can't do. I'm still amazed, though. It may be some of the stuff that you're doing is going to go into the decision making process when it comes time to divide up the territories once again, and who can take what. And when when one group is not catching all that their area would sustain, to let somebody in and catch some more fish. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not all about catching, do you think? Well, I mean, it's allocation, mm-hmm. uh, resource that's I mean, allocation. allocation. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's certainly, uh, you know, we pr- provide advice about, you know, how well, how widely these animals might move. Uh, we leave the actual allocation to the, to yeah. the managers. Yeah, I, the reason why I said that is because we've come up with some interesting debate lately over the last couple of years here on the program and, and at the council meetings was do we have a local ahi mm-hmm. population or not? Yeah. And if so, what size can we catch and what kind we yeah. can't? I 
I feel people buying into, yeah, you know, we are in the middle of nowhere, and probably some of these fish are our own fish, and if we take them, then we won't have them anymore. Yeah, well, we put some electronic tags on a bunch of yeah. uh, big eye, uh, mostly, and uh, they didn't, you know, over the course of a, a year or two, they didn't move very far. That's pretty, they, That's. They, is, I think that's fascinating. Yeah. they uh, Because didn't yeah. we in the past, Jeff, wait for, oh, well, we got to wait for the bright Japan current so we get our ahi. Yeah, you know? yeah. No, I think uh, I think uh, they're they're much more local than we 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 realize or we think. I think that one of the fears has come up, and we don't need to belabor a debate at this point. But there are a lot of people that were afraid that their panfish were going to get taken away, and what they didn't realize is that the the, the sustenance fishermen or the guys that's a recreational fishermen is not going to be encumbered. What's going to be encumbered would be the sale of certain sizes, mm-hmm. and that may be, that may be. Is that something that that the, the data and statistics that you're talking about as being one of the ten different services that would be in this big picture? Certainly, yeah, yeah, yeah. right. That if is. people want to know more about what what you're doing um, at the Pacific Island Fishery Science Center, what can they do? I mean, uh, they go to uh, PIFSC, NOAA, Gov, etc. Sure, and then they uh, they go to uh, ecosystems, mm-hmm. and uh, we also have a database of all of our satellite data. If they want to yep. look at some of that, uh, that's all on. The For website. those who don't know, where's the bricks and mortar? Where's your building? We're out on Fort Island, mm-hmm. uh, brand new building. Yeah. We've been there about a year. We used to be up by the university, and uh, so we have a great new building. The ships are out there. The labs are yeah. brand I, new. I think it's a great validation of the value that that we're getting when i say we the taxpayer and the citizen the the value we're getting for the buck it means that the the science is real and it's it, it's being embraced and i think that that's part probably the key isn't that why we do things like this to let people know that hey we're 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 kind of we're panicking but we're not going to say woe is me and the last we got to stop fishing right exactly yeah. mike and and of course uh, that whole building is a testament to the late senator Dan Inouye, yeah, uh, that's who, great. Uh, put that, uh, you know, the self-proclaimed king, king of pork, he called himself. But yeah. boy, oh boy, we've benefited. We, we certainly have. Hey, Jeff, I want to thank you very much for joining me today, and, and continued success. And hopefully, we can see each other again sometime. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, Appreciate that's it. Dr. Jeff Pulavina. He's a PhD, he's a senior scientist and chief ecosystems and oceanography uh, division guy at the Pacific Island Fisheries Science Center. If you put that all in one business card, it's going to go around the block a couple of times. Hey, thanks for being here. We'll be back again next week with another program. In the meantime time if you want to hear something you know what to do drop me a line the mike buck show at aol.com the mike buck show at aol.com and remember fishing is a a privilege not just a right sometimes and we got to share and share alike so for everybody here at uh, at khnr the answer and the pacific island fisheries management group and the western pacific regional fishery management council pop